How's your day been? How's your day been? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Any of that weather close to you? True. True. Yeah, we had we had sirens last night, but. Yeah, growing up in Dallas, we just wait for the we wait for the rumble. Like the sirens, it's like, alright, that's the that's the warning, but if I hear the rumble, then okay, it's serious. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. We had some we had some real close lightning last night, like two in the morning. Like just outside, like maybe across the street, lightning strikes and just shook everything. The windows rattled, power went on and off. Yeah, that's what I heard too. Yeah, that was the same for us when that when that one strike was real close. Outside of that, yeah, we didn't, we didn't lose anything. How are you, buddy? Good, good. We're going to do, friend, I'm a friend of God, but we're not going to do Fallen in Love with Jesus. Okay. Because that's too slow. Okay. And I love the song, but I don't think I can sing it. So, <laughs> so if we were to come up with another option a little faster than that, mm -hmm. what's an option that we can think of right quick? I don't know. Um, what you want? Which one is it? Let's do, okay, um, I am a friend of God, and then we'll do... Um, do you know, um, da, 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 I am a friend of God. Dude, it sounds like we're do, we're, <laughs> we're gonna do, I am a friend of God first, and then, well, let me have this room falling in love with Jesus. What's another song that we can do instead of falling in love with Jesus? <laughs> <laughs> so let's do, let's do, let's do another song. Well, thank you now. All right, thank you. Good evening. Welcome to Central. I'm glad to see each and every single one of you here. I hope that you all fared the storms all right. Um, back where we live in Houghton, it was, it was pretty rough. There's a lot of uprooted trees. And in fact, the house behind us, a, a pine tree went just right through the house. And so... Um, let's just be praying for folks that um, are recovering from all of this and, and cleaning up and trying to figure out what their next steps are. But I'm, I'm glad for the protective hand of the Lord. So far, I haven't heard of any injuries anywhere in the people that were affected around us, and I'm thankful to the Lord for that. Um, but let's go ahead and open in a word of prayer as we get ready to worship this evening. Can we pray? Father, I thank you. Lord, for our health and our ability to be here this evening, to worship together, to fellowship together, Lord, and to study the Word of God together. God, I just pray that you bless this time this evening, bless this time of worship. Lord, we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Everyone, stand up on your feet and turn around and greet someone right quick. I got my card. I got my did card. You, did you have, I, did you have uh, any bad weather in your house? Well, it lightning and thunder, but I just went to bed. Oh, oh, oh. Did you lose electricity? No. We, we, did, we didn't either, and I told people it's because we don't have sin in our life. 
<laughs> All right. I'm gonna work on that one a little. Did you follow the rabbits? I did follow them. I love them. <laughs> Listen, I've been following those rabbits for forever. I know. Lights blinked a couple times, but I was in bed. So oh well, I, ours bed I don't think ours even blinked. Yes. Sir. Yeah. He said tell you this whole world was bad. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. It's good to be here. I am a friend of God. I am thankful tonight that I am a friend of God. Who am I that you are mindful of me? That you hear me when I call? Is it true that you are thinking of me? you love me it's amazing I am a friend of God I am a friend of God I am a friend of God he calls me friend I am a friend of God I am a friend of God You know how some how many of you know that sometimes that when we're singing on the stage the words will blink at the back and have you ever noticed that sometimes when we're singing on the platform we get these big glossy eyed look because we're wondering where all the words are so tonight there's something wrong with the words so we're going to sing I am a friend of God one more time and you're going to lift your hands or you're going to say Lord I might not get every word right tonight but I'm going to praise you because Father God, you've kept us through the storms. You've kept us through the struggles, Lord. I am grateful because he is my God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. I am a friend of God. Amen. Aren't you glad you're a friend of God? Amen. You may be seated. Aren't you glad Ken has the songs memorized? It's all right. Just make up the songs as you go along. We'll sing right there with you. We want our ushers to come this evening. We're going to receive our evening tithe and offerings. Glad the Lord kept everybody safe. Bad weather. But you know what? God is good through it all. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you and we praise you and thank you that we're able to bring to you our tithe and our offerings. And I pray your blessings over your people tonight. Thank you for all the good things you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you as you give. The old chorus says, For it reaches to the highest mountain, the blood will never lose its power. For it... Key... For it reaches to the highest mountain. 
mountain and it flows to the lowest valley the blood that gives me strength from day to day it will never lose its power for it reaches to the highest mountains and it flows to the lowest valleys the blood that gives me strength from day to day it will Amen. Come on, give him praise again tonight. Thank God for the blood. Appreciate Brother Nathan, and Brother Jerry, and Brother Larry for helping us out tonight. Give them a hand. Appreciate them so much. Well, tonight we are on the tribe of Issachar. Issachar. So turn with me to a very strange portion of Scripture. Genesis chapter 30. This is one of those little stories that you're like, what in tar nation is going on here? Genesis chapter 30, verse 14 says, Now Reuben, and he was just a young boy at the time. Now Reuben went in the days of wheat harvest and found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, Please give me some of your son's mandrakes. But Leah said to her, Is it a small matter that you have taken away my husband? Would you take away my son's mandrakes also? You just thought it was brothers who got in fights in the Bible. Here are two sisters who are scrapping it out in the Bible. And, and you know, it's funny. It's been said that when it comes to self-justification, everyone is a genius. Well, Leah in this this story, she accuses Rachel of stealing her husband. How many of me remember just a few weeks ago what happened when Rachel was supposed to marry Jacob? There was the old switcheroo that took place. And yet Leah is saying, you stole my husband. Wait a minute here, sis. I was supposed to marry him. Daddy switched us out. And you know, Leah... At any point in the marriage, could have said, whoo, she kept it a secret too, I'm just saying. But that's what exactly what she did. Well, let's, let's read on, because Leah's being a little snippy with her. And Rachel said, there, uh, would you take away my husband's mandrakes also? And Rachel said, therefore, he will lie with you tonight for your son's mandrakes. And, and let me say this. I was doing a little extra study today. And that word lie, he will lie with you tonight. Every time that this particular word is used in the, the book of Genesis, it, is, it refers, uh, it never is referring to the relationship of marital love. It's, it's not referring to marital love. Basically, it is an unseemly way of lying with her. In other words, she is hiring him out like, you, like a prostitute, okay? It's, it's, not a, it's not a good thing that she is saying. Therefore, he will lie with you tonight for your son's mandrakes. When Jacob came out of the field in the evening, Leah went out to meet him and said, You must come in to me, for I have surely hired you with my son's mandrakes, and he lay with her that night. And the connotation is that basically 
uh, and I hate to even say this, but basically, if you're going to treat me like this, then I'm going to treat you like a prostitute. That's kind of the connotation that's in the, the original language. But look at what verse 17 says. And God listened to Leah, and she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. And Leah said, God has given me my wages, or that word wages is also reward, because I have given my maid to my husband. So she called his name Issachar. So the birth of Jacob and Leah's fifth son, okay? Remember Leah? She had a time where she stopped bearing. Now she's at child number five that she has. And uh, the background of the story, it's odd no matter how you look at it. In the story, Jacob's eldest son goes and he finds mandrakes in the field. And the mandrakes is a lettuce-like plant of dark green color with purple flowers. The fruit is about the size of a small apple. Uh, it was used to make so-called love potions. And it was believed to enhance sexual desires and to cause pregnancy. So we see that Rachel is desperate to have children. And so she thinks, if I have this mandrake, it, I can make this love potion. It will make me fertile. I'll be able to have children. So Leah buys uh, from Rachel the right to lie with Jacob. And let me just go back to the fact that Reuben, the firstborn, finds this mandrake and he brings it to his mother. He knows his mother wants to continue to have children. He knows these things. Let me say this about the home. You may think your kids are little, but kids know. They know when things aren't right. And, and that's what we see with Reuben. He probably felt bad for his mom because his mom was in this situation in which she was unloved, so to speak, by Jacob. And so he's, he's trying to help out his mom. So Leah buys from Rachel the right to lie with Jacob. And Rachel sells her potential to have a child with Jacob for the mandrakes because what Rachel is doing is she is depending on the arm of the flesh. She is trusting in magic potions in order to get her, her, her desire to have children. And apparently she was not familiar with the story of Jacob's brother Esau. It is truly sad that people miss out on the greatest blessings for God because they choose their own way instead of God's way for their life. And remember this, God cannot be manipulated. He cannot be manipulated. Don't try to manipulate God. He can't be manipulated. You can manipulate people, but you cannot manipulate God. He sees through you. And when Leah gives birth to a son... She declares that God is rewarding her for giving her maidservant Zilpah to Jacob. Now, that sounds a little bit strange, doesn't it? This is my reward for giving Zilpah to him. I don't know about that. However, this does not reflect the way God feels about the matter. It only reveals how Leah feels. God merely tolerated Jacob's multiple marriages. It was Leah's prayers not her manipulation of the situation that results in her giving birth. The Bible is clear. God heard her prayers. He wasn't interested in how, how mandrakes and all of that other stuff. The Torah stresses that God responded to her prayers, not that it was some magic power in the mandrakes or any of that other stuff. And Leah names this Jacob's eighth son, Issachar, and his name means reward or hire. She names him that, Jacob's sons, for this mandrakes. Uh, she, she had her hire with the mandrakes, but her reward came through prayer. She hired him with the mandrakes, but her reward came through prayer. And as Jacob blesses his children, he says of Issachar, Genesis 49, verses 14 and 15, Issachar is a strong donkey. Hallelujah. Thanks, Dad. He's a strong donkey. Now, we often consider being called a donkey an insult. But in Old Testament times, a donkey was considered a noble animal. Kings would, uh, you know, donkeys were something that we see throughout Scripture. And the image used here is of a, that of a strong people who aren't afraid to carry burdens. That's what we see 
in Issachar. And thus Issachar is pictured as a faithful servant, while his name means reward. And so let's examine Issachar, the servant's reward. And I'm not even going to look at the picture of the donkey because it brings back bad taste in my mouth from kissing that thing. That donkey was a lot fluffier than I thought it was going to be. And I thought just a little peck on the forehead and my head kept going deeper and deeper into the the fur. And so I got a taste of that donkey. And uh, anyway, I hope you got your money's worth. <laughs> anyway, we, we all made it through. All right, so let's talk about, first of all, the reward of the burden bearer. The reward of the burden bearer. Uh, Verse 14, Genesis 49, 14, Issachar is a strong donkey laying down between two burdens. He saw that rest was good and that the land was pleasant. He bowed his shoulder to bear a burden and became a band of slaves. Now, the traditional rabbinic interpretation that this reflects Issachar's spiritual role as the bearer of the yoke of Torah. Uh, in tradition, that Issachar was a tribe that we'll see was one that really moved into studying the law of God and would be teachers of the law of God. They weren't Levites. They were, they were the tribe of Issachar, but they really loved the law of God. And in Jacob's blessing uh, to Issachar is pictured at one of bearing two burdens. Now, commentators don't agree as to the exact nature of what Jacob's blessing means. Some see Issachar as not having a good end, while others see that Issachar is one who serves faithfully and becomes a willing servant. And like a good, pro, a good politician, I'm going to say I agree with both of them. All right, it's kind of like, you know, old uh, Lyndon Johnson used to say, well, some of my friends are for it and some of my friends are against it, and I stand with my friends. What we, what we see in these verses is a tribe that willingly bears burdens. The land that Issachar would inherit would also be a fertile land. In one regard, their service to the other tribes is that of being a breadbasket for the nation. Issachar was the blue-collar tribe bearing the burdens of many. They were the ones, they, they were the workers. They were the ones that kept the country running. They were the breadbasket, the blue, blue, blue collar workers that are necessary for a nation to be prosperous. That's what they were. And the prophet Isaiah tells us that Jesus, who is our great example, was also a burden bearer. Remember Isaiah 53. Surely he has borne, he has carried our griefs and carried our sorrows, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Aren't you glad Jesus is a burden bearer, that he carries our grief, our sorrows? The Apostle Paul exhorts us to bear one another's burdens. Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. He said to the church at Rome, we then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. There's something about us as believers that God calls us to help be burden bearers, not the ones that are placing burdens, but we're there to help bear the burdens of our brothers and sisters in the Lord. You know, even Jesus had help carrying the cross. Remember Matthew 27, verse 32. Now, as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. It was still the cross that Jesus had to get on. But Jesus had help getting it to Calvary. He had somebody there. It was Jesus' cross. You know, you, every one of us have our cross to bear. Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. And sometimes that cross is very heavy. And we need those people that will pray with us. Those people that will encourage us. You know what they're helping us do? They're helping us get our cross down the road. And we can't just turn it all over to them. We still have to get on that cross 
But thank God for those that walk along beside us and help us when we're having troubles. Simon helped Jesus to carry his cross. He helped him to get where he was going. There is no indication when Simon is pulled out of the crowd that Simon was somebody who even knew who Jesus was, was a follower of Jesus or anything of that nature. But we do know after this encounter that his children are serving the Lord in the book of Acts. His children or serving the Lord. Something about this encounter with Jesus, helping Jesus carry his cross, it changed Simon's life. It changed his life. He carried that cross all the way to where Jesus got on it. He witnessed the events of that day, and his children would serve the Lord. Notice the rest of Jacob's prophecy concerning Issachar. Genesis 49 verse 15 said, He saw that rest was good, and that the land was pleasant, he bowed his shoulder to bear a burden and became a band of slaves. Now, this verse can be taken literally as a reference to the agricultural prosperity uh, uh, and also as a symbol, symbolic allusion to the tranquility and the pleasantness that comes from being a person who studies the Torah, the Word of God. That's what rabbinic sources say. Issachar, the burden bearer, he is promised rest. Now, we all like that idea, don't we? When you've had a hard day working, don't you like the idea of rest, of relaxation, of just being able to kick your feet up and take a break? Issachar is carrying this burden, and there is that expectation that he's going to finish his work, and when he does, there's going to be rest. In God's economy, servanthood comes with the assurance of rest and reward. It comes with that assurance. You know, sometimes when I'm weary, I'm thankful that I can say, you know what, God, one day in heaven, I ain't got to worry about all this. Amen. <laughs> Listen to the words of Jesus concerning the burden, what he says. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He gives us the offer of rest when we come to him. Rest is a reward of those who bear burdens. Number two, the reward for the faithful worker. Let's look at the Mosaic blessing in Deuteronomy 33. And of Zebulun, he said, rejoice Zebulun, Zebulun in your going out and Issachar in your tents. They shall call the peoples to the mountain. They shall offer sacrifices of righteousness, for they shall partake of the abundance of the seas and of treasures hidden in the sand. Now, Issachar is older than Zebulun, but these two tribes are linked together. And one thing that, that they say is that Zebulun uh, helped Issachar in the sense that they wanted Issachar to be a tribe that studied the word, and so they bore a lot of the, the burden to help them to do that and to study the Word of God. And so these two tribes are linked together. Now, to be a faithful servant of God, you have to work faithfully. And everybody said nothing. There are two things said of Issachar and his work ethic here. Number one, his work is a picture of his worship. He will offer sacrifices of righteousness. You can go back and read Romans 12, 1 and see what that's all about. But his work was a part of his worship. And also, he has to fish and dig for his treasure. Now, unfortunately, our society has the mentality of getting something for nothing. Isn't that the world we live in? I just, you know, I should just... Get something for nothing. I, I, I am who I am, and you know what? Here I am. Give me everything that I want. I don't want to work for it. Now, the Apostle Paul warned the Christians at Thessalonica, if anyone will not work, he ain't going to eat. If a person will not work, they shall not eat. Now, let me say this about that. That's, that's looking in a natural, first of all, I can just go back and, you know, when you look at the Jamestown colony, John Smith 
these people were about to starve to death. And he said, look, if you don't work, you're not going to eat. And that really motivated everybody to start working. You know, hunger is a powerful motivating force. And the natural, that's true. You know, if, if, if somebody says, you, if you want to eat, you get out there and work. In a spiritual sense, if we don't find something to do for the Lord, we'll come to church and we'll never be fed because we will not eat. Because, yeah, we, we'll work for food. I, you know, you see those signs up. I, I, I started to take a picture of a guy one day. He's standing there with a will work for food. And directly behind him was a place that had now hiring on the wall. I mean, right behind him, now hiring. And, you know, I started to be really rude and roll down the window and say, Hey, dude, turn around. Look. Go right over there. They're hiring right now. You want to work for food? They'll give you money and you can buy food. But in, the, in a spiritual sense, if we are unwilling to do something for Jesus, we're not going to be really needing to be fed or wanting to be fed. We'll have atrophy that sets in. We're, we're not doing anything. The reward goes to the one who labors, not the one who loafs. I always thought that was a good statement. He's looking for labors, not loafers. The Apostle Paul tells us, Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. So the concept is actually simple. If you neither plant nor water, neither do you receive a reward. Read what the, the proverb, he, he talks about, I went by the, the field of the lazy man. And the wall was broken down and it was overgrown with weeds. And in winter, this guy's going to starve to death because he's lazy. It wasn't that there was anything wrong with the ground. It was fertile ground. It could produce a harvest. It could do something if he would get in there and work it. But he was lazy and so he let it all fall apart. The writer of Hebrew gives us this wonderful truth. He says in Hebrews eleven six, 6, you all know this verse, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he, he is a what? A rewarder to who? To those who diligently seek him. Diligently seek him. Why do people not get anything out of a church service? They are not actively seeking after God. They're not seeking after him through worship and through the word. They're there. They may be in church because of obligation. Listen, obligation is very different from desperation. And it has different results. A person who is desperate diligently seeks after the Lord. He rewards those who diligently seek him. The casual seeker is not promised any reward. Does it say the cat, I'll bless those who casually seek me? You know, if God comes by today, good. If he doesn't, you know, okay, sirrah, sirrah, whatever will be, will be. No, God's looking for people that are diligently seek him. And I'm going to tell you something. Prayer and study and worship, it is work. It's work. I never find prayer easy. You may say, well, I go to prayer and there's angels flying and all that. Well, bully for you. <laughs> the rest of us struggle like everybody else. Yes. We kneel down to pray or we sit in our spot, our chair, wherever you get along with God and you think of everything. You think of your third cousin twice removed that you haven't seen since 1975 and instead of praying for you, you're like, I wonder if I can find him on Facebook. <laughs> huh? <laughs> the way you're laughing tells me you know I'm telling the truth tonight. Your, your mind wonders. You've got to bring it into captivity. You, you have to focus. You have to get with God and, and pray through. And it's sometimes it's hard and difficult. Oh, I know sometimes it's, it's easier than other times. But I'm here to tell you. 99% of the time that I go to the Lord in prayer, it's a battle. 
Praying in the Spirit is easier than praying in the understanding sometimes. You're absolutely right. But we're commanded to pray in the Spirit and to pray with the understanding. We're, we, we, we're commanded to do both. And so the thing about it is, is that it, is, it, it takes persistence to be diligent and to diligently seek after the Lord. But there is a reward when we do that. There is a reward that takes place. We have to discipline ourselves. We have to make sure that our mind is set on finding Jesus. I'm I'm going to find him. I'm going to call on his name today. And you know what? The thing about it is, a lot of times we'll pray when we feel like it. But faith prays despite your feelings. Faith says, it doesn't matter what I'm feeling. It doesn't matter. If, if I never sense or feel his presence again, it does not negate, negate the fact that he's God and that he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. I don't get in prayer every day and feel Holy Ghost doodads running all over me. Sometimes I do, and I love those days. But most of the time, I'm not feeling any of that. But I have to keep seeking him while he may be found. You say, well, this is depressing. I thought there would be that time when it would be like walking into the Holy of Holies. Listen, the high priest only did it once a year. <laughs> Sometimes you gotta, you got to go through some stuff and, and just be persistent and seek God. And you may not feel anything. You may not see anything. But I'll tell you this. If you have faith, you can know God is doing something. He's moving by his spirit. He's at work. He's at work in our lives. I don't know where I'm at my notes. Okay, here we are. Look at what Jesus said. Revelation twenty two twelve. 12. Behold, I'm coming quickly. And what's with him? My reward is with me to give every to everyone according to what? His work. His work. Remember that old the Gilligan before he's on Gilligan's Island. He played this guy named, uh, what was that? What was his name? Dobie Gillis, yeah, the Dobie Gillis show. Andy, you're old, man. You knew that. But anytime you said he was a beatnik, and anytime you said the word work, I heard it over there. He work, you know, he didn't want no work. Well, listen, when Jesus comes, his reward is to give to every man according to his works. He's going to give them a reward according to their works. You know, 20 years ago, I went to China, and I was at the Ming tombs, and, and going through the Ming, there's something to see, man, these Ming tombs, and I'm looking at one of these, these tombstones in the Ming tombs. They have this huge tombstone. This, this Chinese emperor from the Ming dynasty, he did nothing his entire emperorship, absolutely nothing, nada, yet. He sat around and drank alcohol and ran with women all day. That's all he did. And when he died, they just put up a tombstone and it had nothing written on it. Nothing. I mean, it's, 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 it's a gorgeous headstone. But the other ones, boy, they list their accomplishment. You know, he was Phi Beta Kappa. He did this. He did that. He brought peace to the Middle East. He was this and that. But this guy, he didn't do anything with his life. And so everybody, here it is, 500 years after his death, and what is he known for? He's got a tombstone with nothing written on it. And friends, I'm here to tell you, when we stand before God, if we haven't worked in faith for God, we're going to stand there and be ashamed that there is no reward for us. Many people view the, day of the, Lord, the delay of the Lord's return as an excuse not to work for it. But Jesus said in Matthew 24, Therefore, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. In other words, blessed when I come and I find you working. I heard the story of a man <laughs> worked in a plant and uh, fell asleep one day at his desk in the in the place where he worked there at the plant. 
and his boss came in and he heard the boss open the door. When the boss opened the door, the man startled him awake and he went, amen. <laughs> was he sleeping or was he praying? The world will never know. Well, I'm going to tell you, he knew his boss was coming. He better look like he was doing something. Some people, some people though, they think they're too spiritual to work. James corrected those who were too spiritual to work with this admonition. Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is what? It's dead. Here's something for you. You can take this home if you learn nothing else tonight. When you're too spiritual to serve, you're a flake. When you're too spiritual to serve, and that's the best picture of a cornflake I could find. But really what we have a lot of times is granola Christians. You know what a, a granola, I've been to granola churches. It's full of fruit, flakes, and nuts. <laughs> don't be a granola Christian. We don't need fruit, flakes, or nuts in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're too spiritual to serve, you are a flake. When you work for the Lord, your labor is never in vain. God is a God who is, is a rewarder of those that diligently to seek Him. And without, when you serve the Lord, there's always going to be a reward in the end. Remember when Peter lent Jesus his boat to teach from? Jesus is going to be a debtor to no man. Peter's back there. He's, he's tending his nets. Jesus asked to borrow his boat, push out a little way so I can teach from the boat to the crowd here. And Jesus stands on the boat and he uses Peter's boat as a pulpit. He preaches to the crowd and he's not going to be a debtor to anybody. And he says to Peter, go back out there and let your nets down. And Peter had a great catch of fish. Why? Jesus was paying him for the use of his boat. When you do something for the Lord, he's going to do exceeding abundantly above all you could ever ask or think if you'll just trust in God. But Paul said this to the church at Corinth. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. If we are faithful in our service to the Lord, one day we're going to hear him say, well done. Good and faithful servant, you were faithful over a few things. I will make you a ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. And in Issachar, we see that there is a reward for the faithful worker. And that brings us to the final point. Let's talk about the reward of the wise. The reward of the wise. There's an interesting verse of scripture in 1 Chronicles chapter 12. It says, of the sons of Issachar who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do, their chiefs were 200 and all their brethren were at their command. Issachar, the tribe, was among the first to accept David as the king. The scripture tells us they had an understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. The Hebrew word for understanding is binya, and it has the meaning of wisdom and discernment. In other words, they were able to put two and two together. We live in times of uncertainty, don't we? We do. There, there are people, I mean, just look at the state, not only of the world, but just look at the state of our nation. People don't know what to do. I mean, we've had one crisis after another crisis after another crisis. Inflation is at eight, what is it, 8.5? Is that the last thing? 8.5%, 8.5%. More, 40 years ago, I mean, when I was being taken care of by my parents, it wasn't a big deal. It becomes a bigger deal when, you, <laughs> when you're not being taken care of by your parents. But 40 years ago, I was, you know, at home being taken care of by mom and dad. But today we see that inflation, and look, I'm just going to tell you, I don't want to be somebody that's a purveyor of bad news, and I don't want to be somebody who's Mr. Negative, but I'm going to tell you, if they keep being stuck on stupid, it's only going to keep going up. It's going to keep going up. 
President Biden was in Iowa the other day and, you know, we're going to fight this. We're going to solve the energy crisis. And it's like, dude, call the last guy that was in office. He'll tell you what to do. <laughs> call that guy. Even the bird flying over didn't believe it. Did y'all watch that? <laughs> I mean, a bird flew over and left a present on his jacket in the middle of his speech. <laughs> but with fuel prices, we're getting the uncertainty because people, they're like, I've got to go to work. And it takes gas to go to work. So do I pay my house note or do I pay gas to get to work? I, I, we're going to pay the rent, but we can't pay our food this week. So you know what? We'll have a house to die in because we're going to starve to death. Those are very real things that people are dealing with right now in our nation. And there is uncertainty all about because of it. It's not time, though, for God's people to be panicking. Because God is the supplier of all of our needs. And he gives us the wisdom. If we'll be like Issachar, he'll let us know what we need to do. He'll let us know what we need to do. The nations are in distress and perplexity. Jesus said that's what the last days would be like in Luke chapter 21. It'll be a time of distress and perplexity. People not knowing what to do. There is only one thing that we can do, and that is to be like Issachar and attach ourselves to our heavenly David, to the king of glory, and know that he's going to take care of us. We must in these days have that spirit of Issachar that work ethic, that determination, that good sense, that dependability, and say, you know what? This world may be going, going to pot all around us, but I'm going to attach myself to Jesus, and I know that he's going to bring me through. The reward goes to the wise servant. That's who the reward goes to. Matthew 24, Jesus said it. I'm going to read it again. Matthew 24, who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Jesus wants us to have wisdom, to be like Issachar, to move in that wisdom, to understand the times, to know what we ought to do. King Solomon writes in Proverbs 3, happy is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding. Happy is the man who finds wisdom. Man, I want to be happy. I want to go back to Asher. Remember, we talked about him last week. I want that happiness that comes in finding wisdom. I want to be that person with understanding. For her proceeds, the proceeds of wisdom, are better than the profits of silver, and her gain than fine gold. That's what wisdom's like. You know, knowing what to do, having that understanding that comes through the wisdom of, of knowing what to do. You know, there's a story of Henry Ford. He had this big production line, and this, the man who invented it was, uh, had invented this thing, and it broke down. And so Henry Ford called the man and said, you need to come and uh, check out what's going on here. And so the man was a, a, a man of small stature. I can't remember his name, small stature. And he climbed way up inside the machine. He was in there about 10 minutes. He came out. And he gave Henry Ford a bill for $10,000. And Henry Ford said, you are charging me $10,000 when all you did was tinker with it for 10 minutes. I want an itemized report of this. This is, this is crazy. And the man basically said, labor, zero. Knowing where to tinker, $10,000. Happy is the man who has wisdom because <laughs> he'll know where to tinker in the end. Here's another thing that Solomon wrote. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And in all your getting, get understanding. Exalt her and she will promote you. She will bring you honor when you embrace her. So wisdom is that thing that we need, that we see that Issachar, they had the wisdom to realize 
Saul and his descendants, that's a losing bunch. God's anointed David. We're going to follow David, even when it was not yet popular to do so. When you feel your wisdom is lacking, then what do you need to do? You need to follow what James said. If any of you lacks wisdom, what do we need to do? We've got to ask. We've got to ask. Don't just think that, you know, they say that Alexander the Great, he slept with a copy of, of um, Homer's Odyssey under his pillow because he wanted to absorb through osmosis, I guess, the wisdom of, of the stories that's in the Odyssey and the Iliad. And so he slept with that under his pillow. You can put a Bible under your pillow at night, but if you never open it, and you never study it, and you never read it, and you never pray, guess what? You've just slept with your head on the Bible, and that's it. You might as well get the New York City phone book out and do that. It, it'll have the same results if you do that. And when it comes to, to wisdom, we have to ask. We can't just expect it to happen. Ask of God, but look at what God does, who gives liberally. And without reproach, and it will be given him. I ask for wisdom all the time. I need it. Every day I'm asking for wisdom. You say, well, what are you facing? I don't know. It's for what I might face. Lord, give me wisdom today. I need your wisdom. I need, I need understanding. I need to know what to do. You know, when Solomon writes that in, in Proverbs uh, 1 and Proverbs 2 and Proverbs 3 about get wisdom, make wisdom, the principal thing, ask for wisdom, you know, he said, my father taught me this. I've said this before. My father taught me to get wisdom. David told Solomon, you need to get wisdom, son. Make sure you have wisdom. And he said that, so when the Lord spoke to Solomon and said to him, ask whatever you will. Whatever you want, Solomon, you ask me for it. And what did Solomon ask for? He asked for wisdom. He didn't ask for riches. He didn't ask for his kingdom to be strong. He didn't ask for anything. But God said, because you've asked for wisdom, that pleased God. Because you've asked for wisdom, I'll give you everything else. It was that moment. It was a Matthew 6, moment. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. If you're a person who seeks the kingdom of God, you will naturally be a person that seeks wisdom. It'll come natural. If you see God's kingdom, that's a natural byproduct of it. You're also seeking the wisdom of God. Because to know what we ought to do, to have an understanding of the times, to know what we ought to do, it lets us know how we are to present ourselves in this kingdom, how we are to live for God. We have to have wisdom. And the good thing is, even the simple can gain wisdom through God's word. Psalm 19, 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. I'm going to tell you something. And I, I believe this with all of my heart. Serving Jesus makes you smarter. You say, well, I know a lot of dummies that say they serve in Jesus. That may be the case, but think about how dumb they'd be if they didn't serve Jesus. <laughs> I mean, they, they, they'd be a pot, a pot plant if, if, if they didn't serve Jesus. I mean, they, they, they're, they're a pure genius compared to a lot of people. But it is true. When we, when we begin to serve the Lord... We become a new creation. Now, I'm not saying you're going to be Einstein and be able to split the atom. Don't get me wrong. I'm saying that there comes with that an understanding and a sense of how to live. The other day, uh, Pastor Jeff and myself and Josh, we were up at uh, Pastor Brian McDonald's church in Texarkana. We had a meeting up there. And uh, the man who was speaking had a Ph.D., very, very humble, very smart man, had, the, had a Ph.D. And he was talking about this man that took the church that basically he turned it over to him. He said, I have a Ph.D. He had a GED. And he's taken the church far beyond what I can do. 
God has blessed him. God has used him because of his attitude, because of his walk with the Lord. He said he has the ability to see stuff that I can't see. Now, that's not to say that having an education is bad. If you can get education, go after it. Do everything you can. But I am saying that I have found people who have PhDs who are dumb as a box of rocks. And I have found people who had third grade educations who were geniuses. And I have found people with third grade in education who are dumb as a box of rocks. And PhDs who are the smartest people I've ever met in my life. What I'm saying is this. Serve the Lord. Seek wisdom. And whatever your status of education is inconsequential if you have the wisdom that comes from God. All right. And let me say this. I tell people this all the time. I've had people say, should I go on and get, get this degree or that degree? And I'll tell them this. The greatest and most educated person in the Old Testament wasn't Solomon. I don't think it was Solomon. I think it was Moses. Moses was trained in all the learning of Egypt. He was a PhD from Egypt. I said, and yet he had the most impact in the Old Testament. And the person who had the most education in the New Testament was the Apostle Paul, and he had the most impact in the New Testament. If you can get your education and use that for the glory of God, you can do great things for God. But if you're only doing it so you can have a, a, a thing on your wall, you're that box of rocks I was talking about. Use it for the glory of God. And the good news is even the simple can gain wisdom. Even the simple can gain understanding. Even, even those that don't seem to have it all together. You know, I, growing up, I was not in, in elementary, junior high, high school. I wasn't a strong student. I really wasn't. I just, you know, I had, I had a, my, my algebra teacher, she told me almost every single day, Jeff, you'll never make it in college. Jeff, you'll never make it in college. Jeff, you'll never make it in college. Jeff, don't go to college. You are not smart enough to make it in college. She told me that all the time. I loved her to death, and I got the last word. I preached her funeral. <laughs> As a college graduate. <laughs> but at the same time, I remember my, my French teacher telling me in high school, or telling our whole, she didn't say it to me particularly, she said it to our whole class, which we were a bunch of dummies, so I can understand her saying it. She, she said to us in French class, she said, look, if you're going to be getting a degree in college that's, not a, that's a BA, I'm just going to tell you, you're going to have to take a foreign language. And this is a hard language, and you're, you're probably not going to be able to graduate college if you're getting a BA because you're, you're not smart enough. Listen, I was able to make it through French and not be able to speak French. God help me. God, God help me through it. Uh, merci beaucoup, mon Dieu. Oui. I just said, thank you, my God, very much. God help me. You can have people all day long say, you'll never do it, you'll never do it. But if you have the Lord to help you and you ask for his help, whether it's knowledge, understanding, wisdom, whatever it is, if you just ask God to help. I, when I took my college math, I asked God every single day when my brain was hurting, help me, God. And he did. Whatever you're going through, whatever your situation, the Lord will help you. And the reward of a wise servant is this. What Jesus is one day going to say, enter into the joy of your Lord. Enter into it. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. One day, listen, he's going to say, enter into the joy of the Lord. Well done, good and faithful servant. I'm telling you, I'm going to be leaping and shouting and rejoicing. I'm going to be happy when I make it through. If you're standing in my way, I'm going to jump over you. I'm looking forward to that. The tribe of Issachar teaches there's a reward to the wise. True spirituality and true fulfillment is found in servanthood. This is what Jesus taught at the Last Supper, John 13, verse 15. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, Blessed are you if you do them. Thus the reward of the blessed life is found not in being served, but in serving others. 
Too many people today are looking for mantles of authority instead of towels of service. You will never receive a mantle until you learn how to serve. And Issachar shows us the servant's reward. With three minutes left, it reminds me I, when, uh, let's see, Christopher was almost about to be seven years old, and I took the kids to kids camp from our church. And so they put me, I wasn't in the room with Christopher, I was in the room with the older kids. And, uh, you know, for years we did kids camps and all that other stuff. And I'm thankful that I've graduated from that. I'm really grateful for that. <laughs> and, I, and I remember I woke up that first morning after, you know, you're on this terrible cot and, and uh, they had told me, they said, we'll have, there's coffee up in the, the cafeteria and so I went up there, and I'm the youngest, at the time, I was the youngest pastor in our section, the Natchez Valley section. And, and I want to say youngest, uh, I was about 20 years junior, most of those preachers. And so I walk into that, that room, and my presbyter, Brother Durham, he's sitting there, and he has his Bible open, and he's, he's been reading his Bible. And Brother Durham, he's probably in his 60s, 70s then. And next to him is Brother Cooker, and then there's, there's another pastor. And they, they just all look so refreshed because they're staying in cabins by themselves or in RVs. And, and I looked at Brother Durham, and I said, how long till I get to be refreshed? <laughs> like, like you all. And he said, son, you got several years of this before you can be refreshed, and be in here enjoying it like, it like like we are. And you know what? The thing is, there's joy in serving the Lord. Yes. There was jo I had joy. You know what? Every morning, even though I was bleary-eyed and even though I was tired, I would walk up there and sit with them old ministers and they would just pour into my life. There were, I was, you know what? I was being rewarded for serving, yes. listening to them, yes. talking to them learning from them. I was being rewarded for serving. I was because of what I was doing. And, and there is a reward. Sometimes we wonder, why am I the one doing this and so-and-so is not? Get that out of your mind. That stinking thinking. Pay attention to what you're doing. Peter said to Jesus, when, when Jesus is talking to him after the resurrection, what about this guy pointing at John? And Jesus said, that ain't none of your business. I know I just used some very bad grammar there. I'll even make it even worse. That ain't none of your beeswax. You don't worry about him. You worry about Peter. I'll take care of him. If I want him to live till I come again, what's that to you? What's that to you? You just serve me now who I am. It's about your service. When we begin to look at what everybody else is doing, you know what? We lose our reward. We're comparing ourselves. Be faithful in what God's called you to do. And don't worry about what other people are doing. You be faithful and let God promote you. Let God exalt you. Let God do the work and in everything. Just serve Him faithfully and joyfully. There is a reward coming if we'll just serve the Lord. Amen. Well, I went over by a minute. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Sister Marilyn. The Lord's good. Well, thank you. Hallelujah. See, that's my reward right there. <laughs> Amen. Amen. The Lord is good. Let's pray and dismiss. Father, we love you and thank you for your many blessings. And God, I thank you for the reward of serving you, of knowing you. And I pray that we would all be a people that diligently seek after you with all of our heart, soul, and mind. Now go with us and bring us back at the appointed time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless y'all. We'll see you later.
dodge that. <laughs> you don't make her mad. She didn't help your case out. 